Hello everyone, this is going to be part two of lecture three. So part two, lecture three, we're just continuing where we left off and we're talking about some of the variables that affect subject contrast uh, at the IR. So when it comes to uh, field size, we're talking about collimation and uh, we did mention this before we had our fire drill this morning. However, when the field size is increased, in other words, you're not collimating, then you're going to have more scatter, uh, which is going to cause contrast to go down. Uh, simultaneously, you're also going to increase the exposure to the image receptor, which is what we said in the first part of this uh, lecture. Um, moving right along, another variable that will affect the subject contrast uh, is going to be uh, part thickness. Uh, as we know, the thicker the part, uh, the larger someone is. From, let's say, a asthenic to a hypersthenic patient, you're going to have uh, more molecular interactions, and thus you're going to have more uh, scatter. Uh, and again, whenever scatter goes up, contrast will go down uh, at the image receptor. So that is the effect. And there's not much we can do about this. Uh, it also... Uh, requires an increase in kilovoltage, which in a way is like a double negative because we're also going to have to compensate for that patient thickness by increasing our KV, which is also known to reduce contrast and increase scatter uh, a little bit. Now, uh, there's not a lot on this slide, right? When we talk about subject contrast based on the patient condition uh, or the pathology, and of course those things will affect contrast. The whole idea is without contrast, we can't see things like uh, different pathologies. So uh, without a doubt, the idea is to bring out the best contrast based on the patient condition and pathology by utilizing techniques such as a grid if the part is large, um, the right algorithms that we'll talk about in the future um, when we get more into digital imaging, the use of actual contrast media will increase subject contrast. And this is all done uh, to try to increase the inherent being the internal contrast that pathology would have uh, when it's associated with surrounding soft tissue, for example. And uh, just scatter in general, as we've mentioned, when scatter goes up, contrast is going to go down. Uh, some of the things that we can do to reduce scatter would be to utilize a grid, uh, utilize lower KV. However, uh, not a big fan of using lower KV because we can get noise if our KV is reduced too much. Uh, in terms of the patient, uh, there's not much we can do there. We can't have people, you know, go out on a, and have a diet and come back thinner. Uh, we really don't have time for that, and it's not realistic. Um, the other thing we can do to reduce scatter would be to actually collimate. I should have mentioned that uh, first. Uh, that will also help reduce the exposure to the patient, provided we still make sure that whatever area of interest is in the field of collimation, of course. And use of a grid, right? Uh, we've already said that when we utilize a grid, that's going to be removing some of the scatter. Uh, and thus, when we remove scatter, uh, our contrast is going to go up. And by the way, noise will go down. Uh, the only issue when utilizing a grid or the downside, if you will, is that we have to increase approximately four times our um, exposure in order to make sure that uh, we get enough photons that go straight through the grid versus the ones that uh, diverge and uh, are annihilated and thus wouldn't contribute to the image at all. So the downside is exposure. The upside is improvement in contrast. Uh, OID is very similar to a grid when we increase the distance between the patient and the image receptor, right? So we're talking about the area where the remnant beam would be, right? Those photons that make it through the patient uh, and are on their way towards the image receptor. But that's the key component, on their way. They still continue to diverge. And if the OID is increased, the more that you increase, 
the more potential divergence uh, can occur such that photons will literally not make it to the image receptor. They may just move uh, to the sides of the image receptor. Um, so that scatter uh, would be cleaned up uh, in a technique known as an air gap, uh, which is essentially OID, right? That gap uh, is allowing some of the divergent scatter that's traveling at um, maybe more extreme angles than the regular photons that hit the IR, such that they don't even hit the image receptor. Of course, uh, OID is free, but the downside here is we wouldn't want to improve our contrast by utilizing OID. Grid is much more efficient at doing that, and we don't have magnification. Lots of magnification if you increase your OID. So um, these particular slides that we've been looking at don't necessarily tell you what is the best option. They're just kind of, this is what happens if the OID or if the SID increases, for example. Motion is a little bit different. First of all, there's nothing good about motion. There is no radiological exam, whether it's a nuclear medicine uh, or a PET CT, that the patient can move around or breathe a lot uh, and have there not be a downside or negative uh, to image resolution. But in terms of distortion, uh, your book categorizes motion not as distortion per se. Um, it considers distortion only magnification or minification, uh, elongation or foreshortening, and motion doesn't fit technically into any of those categories. What it does do is create many, many uh, blurred overlapping images that are known as false images. And due to this, uh, your contrast uh, certainly will go down. Spatial resolution would go down too, although we're not addressing that uh, in this slide. So what are our uh, variables affecting noise at the image receptor? Uh, well, let's think about this, right? There's different types of noise, and we'll kind of take them one at a time. Insufficient mass, in other words, uh, not having enough MA uh, and or not having enough exposure time, that's going to limit our intensity. We're going to have less photons. And if you don't have enough photons making it to the image receptor, uh, you're not providing the system with enough, enough data with which to reconstruct the image, you're ultimately going to have uh, the potential for noise. How about number two, insufficient KVP? Uh, which makes quantum model apparent. Uh, that is true. If we don't have enough KV, again, we're not going to get enough photons making it uh, to the remnant beam and then to the image receptor. Uh, and again, you're not going to have enough data uh, to utilize when, you're, uh, when the computer is doing its reconstruction. Uh, now, excessive KV... Uh, is going to also create noise in the form of scatter. So that's very excessive KV. A large field size, as we mentioned earlier, is going to create more scatter because uh, you have more scatter that's diverging. When you cut off some of that divergence, you're getting more of the photons that are traveling in straighter lines. So scatter, when you think about it, is kind of uh, out towards the sides of your image. Uh, part thickness, we said earlier, is uh, really the major source of scatter. Uh, and uh, patient condition, such as uh, any snaps or, or um, foreign bodies that, are, that you're not looking for, per se, can create artifacts. Uh, grids, we said, will reduce uh, scatter, um, but there is a potential, uh, if you use the grid incorrectly, uh, that you can also get a uh, noise if the alignment or the SID range is not correct when you're utilizing a grid, you can get noise. If you don't increase your exposure enough to compensate for the grid ratio, uh, then again, you can get a quantum model, right? You just wouldn't have enough data again. Uh, increased OID, we said uh, several times, is going to reduce scatter. That's our air gap technique. Uh, motion is going to create those false images and lead to kind of blurry images and obviously contrasts 
goes down and, and noise goes up. And uh, positioning uh, can affect in so much as artifacts or obscuring anatomy or superimposed. You're really not much you can do about that. I mean, improper uh, positioning is uh, not good for the image. Honestly, not sure how much uh, there would be an effect uh, on noise uh, at the image receptor other than uh, if your technique was uh, not enough. So let's say you wanted to do something uh, at a certain obliquity and you uh, maybe used more obliquity than was necessary, causing the part thickness to become larger and thus you didn't use enough exposure, uh, that could possibly give you some noise. That's really all I can uh, read into that one. Uh, how about some of the variables that affect sharpness? And when we talk about sharpness, we're really talking about spatial resolution. So our primary factor, as you see here in number one, is our focal spot size. Uh, remember the difference between the actual focal spot um, and the effective focal spot as created by the principle known as the line focus principle. In either case, if either one is reduced, our spatial resolution slash sharpness uh, will increase. So part of that is related to the anode bevel or what's known as the anode angle um, will change the actual focal spot as well as the effective focal spot. And the SOD OID ratio uh, will control our uh, sharpness of the image, right? If OID is increased or if SID is reduced, uh, both of those will decrease the sharpness of the image. Uh, essentially, when the image is magnified in either of those cases aforementioned, then you will have uh, magnification and thus a reduction in sharpness. Uh, so four is pretty much what we've just discussed, right? SID, SOD, and OID, they're all uh, related. Um, at, at any one time, if any of those are uh, adjusted so that there's magnification, you're going to get uh, distortion in terms of magnification, and that magnification leads to a reduction in the spatial resolution sharpness of the image. Right, same thing for uh, five. Essentially, positioning can affect. Uh, so, for instance, if your positioning is not good, where you create uh, a situation where you have more OID than you wanted. Uh, then you're naturally going to have some magnification and thus your sharpness uh, will go down again. Uh, we've talked about motion um, leading to a reduction of contrast, but also that blurry image uh, that appears with motion essentially is obviously not going to be a very sharp image. So sharpness goes down uh, when there is motion. We do everything that we possibly can, such as reducing the exposure time, um, communicating with our patient, uh, reminding them not to move, utilizing, you know, sandbags and other tools like tape uh, when necessary to try to reduce uh, motion. Uh, motion is really a killer. A digital imaging does not do well with motion, really can't understand it, and um, doesn't work very well. So um, maybe one day in the future we'll get there. So. Uh, we've probably touched upon these variables affecting magnification. Of course, we said our, our SID, SOD uh, ratio, if any of those change, in other words, SID being reduced or um, SOD changing could affect magnification. Uh, SID, SOD, and OID, as we've discussed as well, and, and positioning uh, slightly. Right. I mean, if you are, I heard stories of uh, the Y view. People told me in class, uh, I believe last week, people were doing the Y view AP instead of PA. Uh, and that's going to create an awful lot of magnification at the image receptor. However, uh, in certain cases, if the patient, for example, is on a stretcher, it's really uh, going to be very difficult to turn the patient onto their belly and then um, use a sponge and, and angle them uh, or bleak them in such a way uh, that it's makes more sense to do the image in the AP versus uh, a PA, even though you're going to get significant magnification. However, in this particular case, if you're looking for a dislocation, 
then uh, it's something you should still see with the magnification. And uh, it's a trade-off that you'll lose some of the uh, sharpness of the image there. Uh, excuse me, shape distortion. So uh, this is the uh, part where we have to talk about the tube moving around and angles. So uh, alignment of the beam part or image receptor uh, is going to be the controlling factor for shape distortion. Remember, shape distortion is distinct from size. Size distortion will only occur if you have OID or SID. But if there is an angle on the beam itself, right, if the tube is angled, or if the part is not parallel uh, to the image receptor, or the image receptor itself is not parallel to the part, uh, which doesn't happen as often, but it is possible. All of those would cause either foreshortening in the case of the part being angled and the image receptor, um, and the beam being angled would cause elongation. All of those are forms of shape distortion. Alignment, as we've uh, try to do uh, in the lab over the last few days, uh, we are starting to see uh, not huge results just yet, but we do know that when you angle, excuse me, when you don't angle the tube uh, and you just misalign the part, right, so your central ray is not in the middle of the part, uh, if it is several inches away, um, that's representing uh, two degrees of tube rotation, even though the tube is not actually rotated, just based on the divergence of the beam if you're at 40 inches. And if you're at 72 inches, it's a little bit less than that. Uh, it's approximately one inch per uh, degree, or the other way around, every time you're off by one inch, it's as if you angled uh, one degree. And again, uh, positioning. Uh, will cause uh, distortion. For example, you know, if you're trying to do an elbow and the patient can just not flex their arm or extend their arm, I should say, um, so that it's parallel with the image receptor, you're going to have uh, a problem uh, with distortion. So uh, what is geometric, uh, geometric, excuse me, penumbra? Right. Um, so there are a few of these what's known as exposure trace diagrams, uh, and there are several uh, parts of them that are related to the actual exposure uh, that are related to uh, the spread of penumbra, which is an indication of spatial resolution going up or down. Um, so we'll define this better on the next slide. Uh, but we're going to be looking at the slope and the angles of these uh, areas in here. Uh, so this is a, a better example of what we're talking about. So uh, if you take a look at this, right, uh, the background exposure is represented by the height of the exposure trace diagram. So that's this height here represents our uh, exposure. Uh, contrast is represented by the vertical depth uh, over here. Uh, the edge gradient is the slope on the right. But what we're going to be uh, paying attention to most uh, is the slope of this line right here, which is going to determine our uh, blur or penumbra, in which case is going to determine whether our image is essentially getting more or less blurry. In other words, spatial resolution going up or down. So uh, here we see it again, right? Contrast is kind of in the middle here. And penumbra is represented by the this horizontal slope area. But we're looking at the steepness, really, of this line over here. Uh, the steeper it is, uh, the less penumbra you have. Right, so the steeper it is, if it were straight, if this line just went straight up, and I believe you'll see that on the next slide, um, there would be virtually no penumbra, no blurb, the best spatial resolution you can get. So that is actually happening on A, right? If you take a look at this exposure uh, trace diagram, and specifically we're looking at what's known as absorption penumbra, and we've already learned 
that the distortion is going to be more when the objects are spherical. And I think you're seeing this demonstrated in this um, diagram here. So if we take a look at this trapezoidal object in A, which happens to be uh, drawn in such a way that it's perfectly aligned with the divergence of the beam, uh, it's going to produce no absorption penumbra, right? If we look here, this line uh, in terms of slope has the highest slope you can. It's just nice and straight, right? So there is no absorption penumbra there. Now, if you move over to B where we have a, a cuboidal object that's going to absorb a little bit more of the radiation at the thickest portion, right? So we're getting this absorbance right here. And then if you go down to the trace diagram here, you see now um, there is uh, less slope, right? So it's more of a hill compared to the straight vertical. You would definitely want to, if this was a hill, you definitely want to walk up B more than you would with uh, A. And uh, for an extreme example, if you look at C, where you have a spherical object, um, and if you're measuring that, especially kind of from the center of the object, then according to the trace diagram here, this is a very shallow slope, which actually means that you have the most severe uh, form of absorption penumbra, right? This would be giving you the most distortion. Okay, so I am going to stop there. I'm going to put these uh, online. And we're going to pick up uh, with the rest of this discussion uh, in the lab. I'll see you all soon. Thank you very much.